we worked our way through Isaiah 3, verses 16 through 26. And, and in those verses, that being in Isaiah's vision that God has given him, what do we find out? We find out that God is not happy with the Israelite women. Why? Because they've become arrogant, haughty, is what we've been told. Now, now remember, the week before, who did God go after? The leaders of the Israelites. He went after the men. And so now, last week in what we covered, we see him going after the arrogant women with their nose stuck up in the air. No longer are they acting godly. They are now flirtatious. They're infatuated with their looks, with the jewelry that they're wearing. And what is a godly woman? The exact opposite of the Israelite women. For a godly woman is modest. She is not caught up in herself. And like everything else with the Israelites, God has had enough of it. So the very women who took so much pride in their hair would now go bald. No longer would they have this luscious flowing hair. Instead, it would be replaced by oozing scabs. Their pride and their looks would be taken away by ugly. Their fine jewelry and clothing would also vanish once the Chaldeans invaded the lands. They would take the finer things that the women absolutely adored. The very clothes that they adorned themselves in would be taken from them and they would be left with sackcloths. It's hard to be prideful when your head is oozing pus and you're wearing a sackcloth. It didn't stop there. Some of these women would be taken over by the Chaldeans and they would be branded. So where the fine jewelry once was, there would be whelps on their bodies, branding them, showing others that they belong to a certain tribe, whether it be the Chaldeans or another group that came through. Their beauty was gone, but that wasn't all that was taken away. When the Chaldeans finally invade, they will also take out the men. The Israelite men would be slaughtered. There would be a small number left. The ratio from women to men would be seven to one. Now, men, you may be thinking, well, that sounds like awfully good odds. But think about what the women look like now. Seven of them. At this point, as we are reading this, it almost seems if, if there's no hope left. What are the women going to do? There's only one man. They look hideous. Who is now going to protect them? The army is gone. The majority of men, gone. Again, it seems as if there is no hope. But what is the promise that God made his people? That there will always be a remnant. And from that remnant of his elect, the Messiah would come. So now no longer is their faith going to be in the army and the men surrounding them. Their faith is going to be in the one and only protector. God will keep his remnant and his promise will be fulfilled that being the seed the messiah who will come from his people so it sounds it sounds like there's there's hope because there's always hope when you're the people of god even for us today we're sitting here worried about this election that's taking place. 
But why is so much hope placed in one man? When we know where our hope truly lies. In the Holy One. It doesn't matter what happens. It does not matter what happens when it comes to this election. And hear me when I say this. Because if we believe in the almighty, sovereign God, then whatever takes place, he has ordained. And it may not end up the way we think it should, but who cares? All that matters is that he is glorified and he is going to be. No matter the outcome. Our faith is not in man. It definitely isn't in government and it sure is not in a politician but in the holy of holies, his plan is being fulfilled. Okay, so let's, let's move on here. We're looking at Isaiah 5, verses 1 through 7. The vineyard of the Lord destroyed. Verse 1 tells us, Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. So we here have Isaiah who is actually going to bust out into a song. This is a song that they will sing. And in this song, what we are seeing, although the Israelites, the first time they hear this, they're not going to understand this parable by way of a song. They're actually going to believe that this is a loving relationship between a man and a woman. And what we see God do by way of this parable is slap the Israelites upside the head to wake them up. And Isaiah, by way of God, did this on purpose. It's going to affect them, the Israelites, when they get to the part of the song, when they realize that this isn't a song between a man and a woman. It's a song about God and his rebellious people. The song starts out, my beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. It was perfect, this vineyard where it was placed, high up on this hill where the sun could beat down on it and the vines would find all the nourishment that it needed from this fertile soil. Now just so we know this, the Israelites aren't going to grasp this yet, but the beloved one is God and the vineyard are the Israelites. So look at what's being said so that we can understand this again. Not so much the Israelites yet, but it's coming. We understand that what God is saying is that he has provided everything for the Israelites so that they will prosper. He placed them exactly where they needed to be. In the very place that he promised them all the way back in Genesis. It's not going to be behind me, but if you want, you can flip to Genesis 12. We're going to look at verses 1 through 3, the call of Abram. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This was the place that God was speaking of all the way back to Abram. This is the nation that he had promised for the Israelites. This is what he did for them. You can even see how much God loves his people. He continues by displaying this love in this parable. Verse 2 says, he dug it and cleared it of stones. So you have this image in your mind as this song is being sung of this man slaving away on this hill. Removing these massive rocks from the soil. 
And he's doing that so this fertile land can breathe. And once the stones were removed, it's falling away. And it says, and planted it with choice vines. Not just any vines, but choice vines. His choice of vines. This wasn't just an ordinary vineyard. This vineyard was specific. It was made out of love, grace, mercy, and compassion. Nothing went to waste in this vineyard. That's what this man was making sure of. Now again, who's the man? God. There we go. So these massive stones that he's removed, what does he do with those stones? Again, nothing is wasted. It says he built a watchtower in the midst of it. So with these stones, he builds this tower in which he is going to live. Why? So he can protect the vineyard from predators, from man sneaking in. He was going to oversee and protect this land. And while he waits for this harvest, he stays busy and he builds and he hewed out a wine vat in it. He created th this wine vat for his choice harvest. Again, this man has done everything perfect. And so now, what does he do? He waits. He waits for his harvest. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. So you, you picture this man, he's, he's slaved away, he's built a wall around his vineyard, he's built this tower that he's living in to oversee it. He's built a wine vat for these wonderful grapes, for a wine that is sweet and pure. But that's not what happened. Even with the fertile land that he chose, the superior wine, vines that he, I got wine on my mind now, sorry. The superior vines that he planted, but the grapes, they weren't sweet, they were rancid. Now it's here the Israelites would be listening to this song. It's like, well, we thought this was a love song. I'm not sure where it's, it's going now. It's kind of a sick little twist in here, but we'll, we'll keep listening. And maybe even asking, I wonder how this woman is, is going to feel about this vineyard this man has created for her. And when she gets there, finds out that these very grapes that he's worked so hard for are no good. Well, here's the shocker for the Israelites. Here's where they begin to realize that this song is a parable about them. Verse 3 says, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. Oh, man. This isn't going where they thought it was. So the song is interrupted by the owner, owner of the vineyard revealing himself. And in doing so, he invites the Israelites, more than likely, its leaders, in on what this song is all about. So the leaders and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and Judah are being asked to make a judgment. So now they are being brought in to a conversation about this song that they thought was a love story. And of course, this question is 
brought about to trap the Israelites into condemning themselves. Verse 4 says, What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I look for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? Okay, pause for a moment. So we have, we have the Israelites. Think about everything that God has done for them. He's freed them from slavery. He's led and guided them through the wilderness, providing for them along the way. He's given his people his law, his prophets. He's revealed himself to them. He's cared for them. And what have they done? There's a time where they will worship him. And then there's a time when they rebel against him. And there is a time when God's patience runs out. So here God is saying to the Israelites, you think about everything that I have done for you. Look at this. Everything I provided. And then what do you do? You turn from me. You turn to the world. You create your own idols. When I look for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? grapes for the man in this song we are told how hard he has worked and for that labor the wine should be sweet and not sour so he's asking them is there anything else I could have done What's he really saying here, church? Who is at fault? Who's at fault? It's not the holy of holies. It's not the perfect one. It's not the one who's provided the way, the rescue, and who will provide the redeemer. So if it's not him, then who? And we don't get the answer from the leaders of Israel or the inhabitants. But the only answer they could have given was there was nothing else that man could have done. So now Isaiah goes into what the man is going to do to the vineyard that did not produce fine grapes. Look at verse 5. And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I'm sure the Israelites were asking Isaiah to go back to the first couple of verses. That was a whole lot more pleasing to hear. God's wrath is going to fall upon those who have rebelled against him. In this song, what is going to happen is that watchtower, that wall that was built is going to be torn down. And in doing so, the predators will be welcomed in. The thorn hedges that protected the crop, gone. There's not going to be a barrier between the vineyard, the predators, And those who just want in, that has been taken away, there's no longer going to be a watchtower where the man sits in it and oversees the vineyard. The protection is gone. This is what is going to happen when the Chaldeans invade Judah and Jerusalem. God's protection is going to be removed. And rightfully so. Because the wicked deserve his wrath. He 
He goes on to say, I will break down its walls and it shall be trampled down. The very rocks that he pulled from the soil, that he broke his back moving, are going back to the ground. No longer will they stand upright. The protection is gone. Verse 6, he even says, I will make it a waste. The fruit that was produced, the very grapes that he was waiting for, were of no use. So now the man will make sure that the vineyard is no longer useful. And so we see the imagery taking place. You picture this man who is slaved away. And now he's going through like a madman destroying everything. Everything that he has worked for. He's tearing it to the ground. The Israelites understood this. They may not have believed it, but they understood it. That everything God had built for his children, he was going to tear to the ground. He was going to tear it down. Done. He goes on to say, it shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. The man will no longer care for that vineyard. No, instead, he will let it be taken over by what surrounds it. No longer will he protect the grapes from the elements, but it will be the elements that will end up destroying it. And it's here in the song that the owner is about to do something supernatural. Something that only God can do. Look at what it says. He says, I will also command the clouds that they rain, that no, they rain no rain upon it. Now the people are looking at each other. They're saying, this song really isn't about a man, is it? No, it's about God coming from us, coming for us. Did I say from us? That was awkward. But that's something only that God can do. So now their eyes have finally been opened for God's wrath is coming. But there's something else that we need to see in this verse. The man in the vineyard was not just going to protect his vineyard from the natural elements. Now he was going to allow those elements to take them over. But at the same time, he's also going to take away the vineyard's life source. There will be no opportunity for the vineyard to grow. For without water pouring upon it, that's it. It's over. Already, the grapes are going to be choked out by the weeds and thorns. But to take away the rain, well, it seems as if there's no hope. And then, Isaiah through this song, delivers the shocking blow to the listeners. Verse 7, the realization comes home. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. Now the house of Israel, it's God's people, the Israelites, and the men of Judah being their leaders. His people were suppo supposed to produce good fruit. But it didn't happen. 
their leader specifically produced rot. And from the leaders, that's exactly what the Israelites followed. See, it was the leaders who brought in the false idols. And by way of the leaders doing it, the Israelites followed. See, the leaders turned from the laws of God and embraced the worship of the world. They trampled on his laws. And so did the Israelites. And once a nation begins to trample on the laws of God, righteousness is nowhere to be found. goes on to say, and he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. You know what was taking place in the land of Judah and Jerusalem? The powerful were mistreating the poor. And if these leaders were true men of God, true followers of God's law, that would have never happened. The laws of God don't allow it. For one is to look out for the weak and the poor, not take advantage of them. So oppression has fallen upon the weak. He continues to say, for righteousness, but behold an outcry. For these leaders were no longer righteous. They were worldly. And arrogant. No one else mattered to them except for the person they saw in the mirror. Again, the leaders had turned from God's law. So now his law was going to bring them to judgment. Now we read this today and we say, man, that's awful how the Israelites treated God. Couldn't imagine doing such a thing. Really? Think about what you're saying. For it was God who gave the Israelites again the land, protection, his laws, his prophets, and they promised Messiah. Now, we're at an advantage today because we know who the Messiah is. And yet, is the church today truly different than the world? See, that's the reason why punishment was falling upon The Israelites then, they claimed to worship God, but they were no different than the world. This still speaks to us today. We claim Christ and Him crucified, but are we any different than the world, church? Do our actions line up with our proclamation? Yes, we are not certain what is going to happen when it comes to the results of this election. Again, God is sovereign. Our faith is in him and not in man. And I am no prophet. I know what you're thinking. Really? No, no prophet. But would we be surprised today if Biden is elected, if that wasn't God's wrath being poured out upon us? Now, even in God's wrath, 
he is going to be glorified, and we should find comfort in that. Because what this may do, it may reveal the true church in this land. Here in the South, we have a church on every single corner. And that's terrifying. So maybe, maybe if Biden is elected, and and I'm praying not, but maybe God's patience has run out. And for any of us sitting in here today who can honestly say, why would his patience run out on us? But here's what we can pray for, and knowing that we serve this almighty sovereign God, that maybe by way of Biden going into office, God's wrath is going to eliminate the false church and bring up the true one. And we should say amen and amen to that. Just because we have a church on every single corner does not make us righteous. For I would much rather have one church in a hundred mile radius preaching the word of God where people have to travel to come to it than to sit in a church on a street corner that does not preach the truth. So let us find comfort in knowing that we serve the almighty, holy, sovereign Lord. That's where our comfort lies.